There's an X along Elm Street in Dallas. There's not another one like it anywhere else in the country. That's because this X marks the spot where President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. What you're about to see is the story of what happened here that day, as told by those who were here, covered it, and will never forget November 22, 1963. The presidential car moving out, head out for downtown Dallas, where thousands should already be on the street right now, awaiting for a view of the president and his wife. Three shots were reportedly were fired at the lead reverberating explosion. Shots definitely were fired at the presidential motorcade. I heard three loud shots seemingly from right over my head. President Kennedy has been shot. He's rather confused at this moment. Suddenly the Secret Service men sprang into action. Guns drawn, ordering people to lie flat. Both the President and Governor Connolly were wounded in this shooting event. And round as fast as they could get there to Parkland Hospital. The police are now surrounding the area down here. Sirens are screaming. Police believe the man who fired the shots is still in the Texas School Book Depository building. We have just been told by a member of the staff at Parkland Hospital that President dead. It's unbelievable that the President of the United States is dead. It's November 1963, and the re-election campaign of President John Kennedy is in high gear. Just four days before he arrives in Dallas, the president is campaigning in Florida. He is comfortably ahead of likely Republican opponent Barry Goldwater in the national polls, but he lags in Texas, where conservatives, particularly in Dallas, are creating an inhospitable atmosphere. Flyers are posted accusing the president of treason, and a full-page ad runs in the Dallas Morning News asking the president why he is soft on communism. A month before, U.N. Ambassador Adlai Stevenson is picketed and heckled during a U.N. Day speech at the Dallas Convention Center. Protesters even bop him on the head with a placard. I uh, got the only pictures, that, uh, the mo only motion pictures, of uh, the woman from behind taking a sign and hitting him over, over the ear here. Outside the auditorium, one man spat on him and a woman, Mrs. Cora Fredrickson, hit him with her placard. The next night, Walter uh, Cronkite had the then at 6 p.m. news on CBS, and he played that film over and back and over and back, and made the uh, remark that the woman who did the placard had said that, uh, and I'm gonna use her words here, uh, that a Negro uh, pushed her from behind. Well, Cronkite played it over and over, and there was no black face anywhere to be seen. So that was dis disproven right off the bat. Retired Army General Edwin A. Walker has been promoting conservative causes in Dallas and speaking out against perceived threats by the communists, but not without opposition. The previous spring, a guy named Lee Harvey Oswald fires a shot into Walker's Dallas home, missing his head by just a few inches. Governor John Connolly and others urge the president not to come to Texas. The atmosphere, they say, is just too anti-Kennedy. It's a mood also felt among the crowd at the Dallas Trademark, where the president is scheduled for a noon hour speech. Judge Hughes walked in at the last minute and I jumped up and asked her how she was feeling and she said, I will be glad when the president is safely out of town. I do not feel good about this. But Texas Democrats are feuding. Senator Ralph Yarbrough isn't getting along with Governor Connolly or with Vice President Lyndon Johnson. Yarbrough even refuses to ride in the same car with the Vice President during Kennedy campaign stops in Houston and San Antonio. The nation's youngest president comes to Texas to mend those frayed fences. Kennedy only carried the state by 46,000 votes in 1960. He needs Texas to win in the Electoral College in 64. Patching things up among Texas Democrats would be a good step toward re-election. On the last morning of his life, the president is greeted by a huge crowd waiting in the mist outside the Hotel Texas in Fort Worth. Then he charms a Chamber of Commerce breakfast with a touch of presidential humor. Two years ago, I said that, uh, introduced myself in Paris by saying that I was the man who had accompanied uh, Mrs. Kennedy to Paris. I'm getting that somewhat that same sensation uh, as I travel around uh, Texas.
Nobody wonders what Lyndon and I wear. But we're... There's Mrs. Kennedy, and the crowd yells, and the President of the United States. By the time Air Force One lands at Love Field in Dallas, the stormy skies have cleared. Beautiful break in the weather. Just a beautiful break in the weather. Clear blue sky and a warm sun. The crowd was just ebullient. They were just, uh, they were just eager and happy, and the day had turned out to be beautiful after having begun as a foggy and misty morning. It became a beautiful spring day in uh, November. Camelot was a fact in those days. Uh, the Kennedys were beautiful, and despite any kind of political uh, rumblings in Dallas, Texas, it was a great welcome, and it was a demonstration of how Dallas really was the city we loved, and for the right reasons. As he has done in several places, he's broken away from his uh, planned uh, plan and uh, gone right up to the fence to shake hands with people. This is great for the people and uh, makes the eggshells even thinner for the Secret Service whose job it is to guard the man. The presidential motorcade leaves Love Field and snakes its way to downtown Dallas. An estimated 150,000 people line the streets to catch a glimpse of the president and first lady riding in an open limousine. It's the first trip Jackie Kennedy has made as first lady west of the state of Virginia. Dallas Times Herald photographer Bob Jackson rides in the motorcade just eight cars back. And I had been instructed to uh, unload my camera with the film from the motorcade. And I was to, we had uh, Jim Featherston, a reporter, was at the corner of Maine in Houston. And I was to uh, put my film in an envelope and toss it out to him. The wind caught the envelope and he had to chase it and we were laughing. And I remember that's when we heard the first shot and then two more. I made the comment to myself, I said, well, somebody's shooting at the bird, uh, doves, the pigeons, shooting at the pigeons, because they were the whole swarm of them went out behind that school book depository bullet. Shots had been fired at the Kennedy Motor The president Kennedy. has been hit. About that time, Chief come on the radio and said, head for Parkland. Then the race was on. This KLIF bulletin, from Dallas, three shots reportedly were fired at the motorcade of President Kennedy today near the downtown section. KLIF News is checking out the report. We will have further reports. Stay tuned. Two FBI agents were monitoring KLIF, and we were the first ones to broadcast locally that shots had been fired, and they raced to the uh, school book depository immediately after listening to our bulletin. I didn't see the president hit, but what I saw by the time I was you know, out of the car and looking down there was uh, the first lady crawling around on the back of that open car. And I learned later that she was trying to retrieve, retrieve some pieces of skull that had, had flown off. I looked straight up, that's where the sound came from, and uh, saw the rifle on the window ledge and I could see it being drawn in. Even if there'd been film in my camera with the long lens, uh, I'm not sure I could have reacted fast enough to swing it up there and focus and shoot because I looked up there and immediately the rifle was drawn in. Just a few minutes ago, the President of the United States turned from Houston Street onto Elm Street on his way to a scheduled luncheon appearance at the Stemmons Trademark. And as he went by the Texas School Book Depository, headed for the triple underpass, there were three loud reverberating explosions. A cop came running over and said, get down. So we, you know, got down, and I thought, why are we down? And I got back up and then ran across the street and stopped at a couple. It was, uh, you know, the couple with the, uh, with the kids. And I said, are you okay? He said, yeah, but they got the president that blew the side of his head in. I'm, I'm thinking, what, what do you say? If, if you go on the air, are you going to say that the president of the United States has just been shot? Do you say he's been killed? No. One witness who says he definitely was shot, that he was hit twice, that he saw the president slump in his seat. As I say, this is not confirmed at this time. And very often you'll find a zipper hidden in the uh, arm. And Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. You'll excuse the fact that I'm out of breath, but 
About 10 or 15 minutes ago, a tragic thing from all indications at this point has happened in the city of Dallas. Let me quote to you this. And I'll, you'll excuse me if I am out of breath. A bulletin, this is from the United Press from Dallas. President Kennedy and Governor John Colony have been cut down by assassin's bullets in downtown Dallas. They were riding in an open automobile when the shots were fired. The president, his limp body carried in the arms of his wife, Jacqueline, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. I was standing by the motorcycles when the uh, news broke on the motorcycle radio that there's been a shooting in the motorcade, the exact words, there's been a shooting in the motorcade. I watched the, the, the car go by and I saw the pink, which I had seen at Love Field on Jackie's dress, and I saw her bent over. And I saw the motorcycles. And at the same time I saw that was the same time I was heading for my mobile unit. And I, I got in my motor unit and zipped on out of that parking lot and followed them to Parkland. Uh, I jumped in a police car and went to Parkland. When I got there, I found that, uh, that nobody knew too much about where he was hit. But they knew that the president was shot in the head. This is what I've been told now, Jay. The president was shot in the head. Conley was shot in the chest. Both of them are still alive when I left the hospital. But outside the hospital, Sheriff Bill Decker gives Ship every reason to believe the worst has happened. He said, uh, you ever see a deer shot in the back of the head? Uh, you know, and I said, yeah, I guess so. And he said, he pointed to me and I said, it looked good, does it? He just walked on by me, but. And he pointed to me, and, and, and I knew right then and there that the back of the head was gone. He was, the sheriff was pointing to me. I was listening to history. Times Herald reporter Darwin Payne runs several blocks to Dealey Plaza and starts interviewing witnesses. He finds two women whose boss has filmed the gunfire. They take him across the street to the office of Abraham Zapruder. He was very distraught. And at that time, he had a television that was on, and they were, the news accounts were saying that Kennedy had been wounded, perhaps fatally. And uh, Zabruder said, no, no, he's dead. I know he's dead. I was looking through my viewfinder, and I saw his head explode like a firecracker. As the president was coming down from Houston Street making his turn, it was about halfway down there, I heard a shot. Then he slumped to the side. Then I heard another shot or two, I couldn't say what it was, one or two. And I saw his head practically open up, all blood and everything, and I kept on shooting. I can walk the Elm Street area and I can still hear that first shot. Secret Service agent Clint Hill jumps from the running board of the follow-up car and runs to the presidential limousine. A frantic first lady reaches across the trunk from the back seat to retrieve a piece of the president's skull. Suddenly the Secret Service men sprang into action. The convertible bearing the president and Mrs. Kennedy sped away. When I got onto the back of the car and the president was lying in Mrs. Kennedy's lap with his right face up, I could see his eyes were fixed and that there was a gaping hole in the right rear portion of his head above his right ear. Uh, portions of the brain had been removed. It looked like somebody had gone in there with a, a spoon or ice cream scoop and thrown the brain material all over the back of the car. There was blood and brain all over Mrs. Kennedy and the rest of the back of the car. At Parkland Hospital, Hill says Mrs. Kennedy will not let go of the president until the agent puts his coat over the president's head and upper torso to hide his wounds. As federal agents, police, and politicians wait for words no one wants to hear. All of the legislators, dignitaries who had been in the motorcade were just wandering, uh, stunned, uh, and talking in small groups uh, just to try to deal with what had happened. They were, f were not being allowed inside the hospital, so there we were. Uh, and I remember how difficult it was uh, to question people like Ralph Yarbrough, who uh, burst into tears uh, when I was uh, talking with him. He had seen uh, the uh, damage uh, pretty close up. In trauma room one, doctors and nurses work feverishly to try and save the president. Dr. Kenneth Salyer is a first year surgical resident on call that day. He was still agonal, taking some breaths. Uh, but had an obvious severe injury of his right head and cranium and 
a wound of his neck which was with some air moving. So we expanded the wound in his neck and got control of the airway, put a tube into his trachea, so-called windpipe, and uh, got control of the airway. Uh, so that's how we started the situation. There was my hero um, on the table, unbelievable at that moment for me. Bert Ship, meanwhile, realizes he has to get back to WFAA with the film he shot, but getting there is a problem. We had a new car, we rode up here with a detective, and, and about that time, the old Dodge pulled up here at the stoplight in front of the parking lot, and I opened the door and crawled in. I said, take me to Channel 8. I said, I'm the president's been shot, and this and that, and this old man I said, I'm not going that way. And I said, yeah, you are, and I put my foot on the accelerator. I said, you work the brake, and I'll work the accelerator, and then let God work the horn. So we uh, <laughs> went through red lights, and he said, well, you're going to get us killed. I said, no, I said, the Lord's watching this. Experience begins to kick in on many fronts. Reporters and photographers race about the city covering the biggest story of their careers. But the first thing two veteran police officers do after leaving the trademark is go to lunch. Captain Fannin said, um, you and I are going to get a bite to eat. And I remember saying, I'm not hungry, I, just, I can't eat. He said, you are going to eat. And we went to a cafeteria. He ordered our soup for us. He said, let me tell you something. When we get to City Hall, everyone there is going to be burnt out. And they're going to want to leave and refresh themselves. You and I are going to eat because we may not eat again for several days. And he was not lying. I got to the school book defined story in time to go in with the first wave of cons. Back downtown, the Dallas News' Kent Biffle, WFAA Radio's Pierce Allman, and Tom Allier from WFAA-TV are the only media inside the Texas School Book Depository where police go searching for the assassin. While looking for a telephone, Allman unknowingly meets the man. He's a slender, white male, uh, kind of a sallow complexion, thin face, dark hair. Uh, and he simply jerked his thumb and sat in there, and I didn't realize what the confrontation was until the interview with the Secret Service about two weeks later. I assumed that whoever shot at JFK probably killed himself with that last bullet because it was hard to see how he could get out of there, out of the school book depository. And uh, so I went on. Detective yelled, Captain Fritz over here. Well, uh, I thought, well, they found his body. So he went over, but it wasn't his body, it was uh, that uh, rifle. It's a Manlicker Carcano, a bolt action rifle with a four power scope purchased by mail order for $21.45. Nearby stacked boxes at a sixth floor window create an assassin's lair. We found the sniper's nest and we found the, uh, the box uh, petition that he'd put up to keep from being seen. We found his armrest and then we found the three spent hulls against the baseboard. And I told him to stay up there and guard it and I would go down to the street and get to crime lab. Well, when we got down there, and I was telling them about that and ordering the crime lab, that's when the call came in on Tippett. Roy Truly, who was the manager there of the depository building, came in, and uh, this was early afternoon, I guess, and, and said, uh, we had a roll call, and one of our employees uh, didn't uh, show up after lunch, after the noon hour and uh, his name is uh, Lee Oswald. 45 minutes after shots are fired at the president, Oswald flees to the Dallas neighborhood of Oak Cliff. By then, an all-points bulletin has been issued. Dallas police officer J.D. Tippett spots a man, matching the description, walking down the street. The two talk. Then Oswald pulls a pistol and shoots and kills Tippett in front of several witnesses. He then walks to the nearby Texas theater, and while being arrested, tries to kill another officer, M.N. McDonald. Went up 
into the balcony and kicked the fire doors open so we could get some light in the theater. When they finally got the lights up yeah. in the main part of the yeah. theater, and then you know, all these school kids were up there. It might have been eight or nine kids up there. And they all rush over to the balcony with me, and we all look over, and there's the fight. Just as I got to the lower floor, I heard somebody yell from inside something like, this is it, or something to that effect. I stepped inside and saw that at the other end of the row, uh, McDonald was struggling with the suspect. And uh, so I went down the row and grabbed the suspect. McDonald was able to get the gun away from him and then we put Oswald on the floor. There was a struggle in the Texas theater and when uh, a Dallas police officer was arresting him and the pistol was snapped at another police officer's head and didn't fire. At that time, a scuffle ensued inside of the Texas theater where he was arrested by six officers. I had three officers injured during the arrest of this man. Many years later, I was told that in addition to having that pistol, Oswald having the pistol, that he had an open-bladed knife. That he, he held it open and he was sitting on it. So that if he didn't use the pistol, the revolver that they, they shot typically, yeah. he could knife the officer in the darkness. That's what might have been. Whatever doing. happened to that knife? I can tell you, but he, it's, a, it's a blood oath. <laughs> But uh, one of the cops kept it. A little more than an hour after the president is shot, his assassin is in custody for killing a Dallas police officer. Oswald is escorted through an angry mob outside the theater and taken to police headquarters. TV coverage of the arrest is not so successful. WFAA photographer Ron Ryland shot the whole thing with the wrong camera settings. Now we're inside of the Texas theater. Of course, everything is black. The uh, movie is going on. It looks like the the Keystone cops shot it. Anyhow, he uh, comes running in the newsroom and says, Chief, Chief, he's an old Navy man. I've got the Pulitzer Prize. I said, either that or you're going to get your butt kicked. So anyhow, he, we, we opened, we developed the film. And there it is, dark as a coal mine, uh, the first part, where y'all captured him. And after all, it's in the, the outside. It looks like the fires of Hades is <laughs> burning up so much. Back at the Dallas Trademark, where the president is scheduled to speak, 2,400 people have already had their stake and are growing restive. They were wondering what on earth has happened. He's off schedule. And then that door flew open behind me and the Washington press came in and the first words Bob Hollingsworth said to me was the president is dead. Also at the Trademark, KRLD News Director Eddie Barker, who publicly reveals what was confirmed about 20 minutes later. We have just been told by a member of the staff at Parkland Hospital, the president is dead. We have received word that two priests who were with the president have reported that the president is dead. From Dallas, Texas, the flash, apparently official, President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central Standard Time, 2 o'clock Eastern Standard Time, some 38 minutes ago. Vice President Lyndon Johnson <clears throat> has left the hospital in uh, Dallas, but we do not know uh, to where he has proceeded. Uh, presumably, he will be taking the oath of office shortly and become uh, the 36th President of the United States. We wanted to get the Vice President out of there. Well, the Vice President wouldn't leave without Mrs. Kennedy. Mrs. Kennedy wouldn't leave without the President's body. We couldn't take the President's body because the state of Texas had a law that said that the uh, victim of a, uh, of a homicide had to be autopsied in the state of Texas before it could be removed. Negotiations by state and federal officials finally resolved the stalemate. Agents load the President's body into a hearse along with Mrs. Kennedy, Agent Hill, and the President's physician, who was there to maintain the chain of evidence by staying with the body. The casket is too big to fit in the back door of Air Force One, so they maneuver it a bit and squeeze it in. It's decided that Vice President Johnson should take the oath of office before leaving Dallas. But Johnson wants Mrs. Kennedy to be present. She's in the back of the plane with her husband's casket. I received a message that she wanted to talk to me. So I came back to the area where, in which she was seated, 
And she just simply reached out her hand and said, well, what's going to happen to you now, Mr. Hill? And I just said, I'll be okay, Mrs. Kennedy, I'll be okay. And then she went and stood behind, beside President and Vice President Mrs. Johnson while he was sworn in to become the new President of the United States. I just solemnly swear, swear that I will faithfully the new president and the body of the man he replaces are flown back to Washington, where the casket is unloaded, and President Johnson asks for help. I know that the world shares the sorrow that Mrs. Kennedy and her family bear. I will do my best. That is all. I can do. I ask for your help and God's. Kennedy's death sets off a tidal wave of emotions. People cry openly on the street. Flags are lowered to half staff, and Dallas schools take the rest of the day off. Information reaches the KRLD newsroom about children cheering at one school when they are told. Dan Rather of CBS News sniffs a scoop for the network. He reported that the uh, the uh, children ran out of the school uh, shouting joy, uh, very happy, the whole thing. And uh, he said that it happened uh, at the grade school where three of my children were in attendance. Well, no such thing happened. Barker checks with the principal who says the children cheered because they were getting out of school early not because the president was dead. Barker was like Mount Vesuvius. He was kicking cans and throwing CBS people out rather than everybody. He walked back in the newsroom and I said, out, and you and your whole damn gang get out. And oh, I've forgotten how many CBS people were in my newsroom at that time. And I literally threw them out. <laughs> And here comes Lee Harvey Oswald. Lee Harvey Oswald, meanwhile, is being grilled by Dallas police and federal agents at police headquarters. In the hallway outside the Homicide and Robbery Division, it's semi-organized chaos. It's all these huge trucks with all these cables running up to the, up into the building, I guess to the third floor where the press room was and the homicide office. But I got a, went in and stepped out in the hallway and there was that huge mob scene. I mean, I don't know how many reporters there were on Saturday night, but there, there had been time for reporters from all over the country to arrive in Dallas, perhaps a few international ones too. And uh, there were, it was a mob scene. I, I wasn't certain they were all reporters even. One of those in the crowd who isn't a reporter is a Dallas strip club owner by the name of Jack Ruby. Veteran CBS correspondent Bob Schieffer was a young reporter with the Fort Worth Star-Telegram the day of the assassination. He's pressed into service answering the phones. The phone rings and a woman says, uh, is there anyone there who can give me a ride to Dallas? And I said, lady, you know, we're, we're not running a taxi service here and besides the president's been shot. And she said, yes, I heard it on the radio. I think my son is the one they've arrested. And it was Lee Harvey Oswald's mother. Schieffer and another staffer drive Marguerite Oswald the 30 miles to Dallas where she meets with her son at police headquarters. The ride over produces an exclusive for Schieffer, but the woman, he says, is decidedly strange. She was mentally disturbed would be the, the kindest way I could say it. I mean, here this, this shooting was hours old and she was, it was, always, it was all already about her. And she was saying that people would be sympathetic to his wife, would give his wife money, she would be the mother who'd been forgotten and that she would starve to death. And uh, she was totally obsessed with money. Here comes Oswald down the hall again. Did you find that rifle? Yes, dispatches you people have been given, but I emphatically deny these charges. Oswald has hustled uh, through a doorway. He says he has nothing against anybody. He has not committed any act of violence. Oswald never admits firing on the president. In fact, at the time, there was no federal law against killing the president. But District Attorney Henry Wade files state charges on him anyway. He's been charged with both killing Officer Tiffin and John F. Kennedy. 
federal agents quickly began assembling background information on Oswald. He spent much of his childhood in loneliness, drops out of high school, and at 17 joins the Marine Corps. He's a testy recruit, even belligerent, and spends a good deal of his time studying Marxism and the Russian language. He gets an early hardship discharge from the Marines to care for his ailing mother. But within weeks, at the age of 19, he defects to the Soviet Union. That's where he meets and marries Marina Prusikova. But almost three years of living as a Russian leaves Oswald disillusioned, and he returns to the U.S. in the summer of 1962 with Marina and their newborn daughter. Their marriage is a rocky one. They come to Dallas, Lee moves to New Orleans, and then back to Dallas. They fight a lot, so much so Marina and the children move to a house in Irving owned by Ruth Payne, a Quaker who also speaks Russian. The night before the assassination, the Paynes and the Oswalds have dinner together. I did notice that he went to bed very early. Ruth Payne says Oswald usually stays at his own apartment in Dallas, but not this night. The next day, Marina is outside hanging diapers in the clothesline when Payne tells her about the gunshots in downtown Dallas. I said to her that uh, they thought the shots were fired from the school book depository. And I learned later from what people told me that Marina had said she she went into the garage to see if the gun was there and she thought it was still in the blanket roll that she knew it had been in but I didn't see her go in and I didn't realize that's what she was doing so she suspected it immediately. she suspected immediately yes some contend the FBI should have suspected Oswald as well. Special Agent James Hosty had gone to the Payne House to discuss Oswald's involvement with the Fair Play for Cuba Committee in New Orleans. Oswald isn't there, so Hosty interviews Marina. Lee doesn't like it. He goes to the Dallas FBI office only days before the assassination and leaves a note for Hosty threatening to blow up the office. Hosty was not in the office at the time, and uh, Oswald did not uh, interview him, but he did uh, leave a name and address uh, for Hosty to get in touch with him. Hosty discussed this with uh, the uh, agent in charge. They decided as much as Hosty had already been to interview the wife, probably there was no need to pay any attention to him. Hosty never sees Oswald again until after the assassination. While walking in the basement at police headquarters, he admits to Lieutenant Jack Revel and some other Dallas officers that the FBI knew about Oswald. Revel immediately types up a note to his boss, which quotes Hosty as saying the FBI knew that Oswald was capable of committing the assassination of President Kennedy. Hosty denies ever saying that, but friends of Revel say he was not the kind of cop who engages in fabrication. Well, Jack wouldn't have made it up. I know Jack well enough that he wouldn't have made it up. FBI Director J. Edgar Hoover later suspends Hosty, docks his pay, and transfers him to Kansas City. They really screwed him around. He had, he was supposed to interview Marina. She was not, he was not a suspect of anything. Oswald wasn't. But his, his deal was to watch Marina because she had come over from Russia. And uh, hindsight being what it is, of course, I think now we'd know, who, yes, if you have a Russian defector in that, that period, somebody should have told the Dallas police. Somebody should have told the Secret Service. But at that time, under the, the guidelines, he wasn't, you know, he, he didn't think he had to. Yes. I think he was just doing his job, that, that Oswald, as far as the FBI knew, wasn't dangerous. A little weird, maybe, um, but, uh, um, you know, he had gone to the Soviet Union, he'd come back, he didn't look like somebody that the KGB would hire, uh, and, uh, they didn't, I, I felt like, Hosty felt as I did, that this was not a dangerous man, just a rather peculiar one. Dallas Police Chief Jesse Curry later tells Ainsworth if he had known Oswald was a potential threat and working at the school book depository, he would have sat on him till the president left town. The head of police intelligence at the time says the FBI never said anything about any potential risk to the president. When a dignitary like that comes to Dallas, then you cover everybody that's a radical and so forth and so on. You cover those people. If they had known that Lee Harvey Oswald was down there, we'd have done the same thing. We didn't know it. We didn't know who he was. And 
It's just an impossible situation. But police do lock up some people they think are potential problems for the president. That weekend of the assassination, they arrested maybe three people in Dallas who had been carrying picket signs. They arrested them and they held them for about a week. I forget how, maybe more than a week. We did a story in the Times Herald about these guys who are still being held for a conspiracy to commit assassination a week after the assassination had occurred. I think Lee Oswald, the man I knew as Lee Oswald, I think he was a, a lot more intelligent than people gave him credit for. Buell Frazier worked with Oswald at the Texas School Book Depository. The two ride to work together every day, but Oswald never talks much. In fact, he never even mentions the president. We never talked about politics. I remember one time on the way home from work one time, Lee asked me, was I, was I interested in politics? And I told him, I said, no, I said, because I don't trust politicians. I said, I just don't get involved. And we never, that was the only time he asked me one question. And I told him that and then nothing was ever discussed about politics. On the morning of the assassination, Oswald places a package in the back seat of Frazier's car. Concealed in the paper is the murder weapon. As I was getting in the car, I glanced over my, my right shoulder and I noticed a package on the back seat. And I said, what's that? He said, remember? I told you I was coming home to get the curtain rods. I said, that's right. Frazier never gives it a second thought until he's grilled by police who threaten to charge him with assisting in the assassination. Oswald, meanwhile, maintains his innocence. I really don't know what the, what the situation is about. Nobody has told me anything except that I'm accused of, uh, of uh, murdering a policeman. I know nothing more than that, and I do request uh, for someone to come forward. Uh, to give me uh, a legal assistance. The scuffle at his arrest has left him with a few cuts and bruises, which ultimately contribute to his death. I don't have the least idea. Police Chief Jesse Curry has been encouraged by the mayor and city manager to give the media a chance to see Oswald's condition publicly during his transfer from city to county jail. But there have been threats. Homicide Captain Will Fritz and Detective Jim Lavelle try to convince Chief Curry a public transfer, even using an armored car, would be very risky. When that word went out that we were going to use an armored motor vehicle, then the next threat that came in said that uh, they were going to blockade the street and turn that armored motor vehicle over and set it afire. So the cap told Chief Curry, he said, if, if they try something like that, we won't, we'll be kind of hogtied. We can't do much with that truck. But he said, if we're in a car, we can spin it around in the middle of the street and go the other way. And that's when I suggested to the chief, I said, you know, we can bring him out here on this first floor and put him in a car on Main Street and we can be in the county jail before anybody knows we even left the building. And his exact words to me were, Lavelle, I have given them my word that they can film the transfer and I'm going to keep it because I don't want them to think that we mistreated him, abused him, or beat him up in any way. And the best way to do that is to let them film the transfer. There he is. There he is. On Sunday, just two days after the assassination, about half past 11, Lavelle prepares Lee Harvey Oswald for what become the last steps of his life. Lavelle will be handcuffed to Oswald's right hand. I told him, I said, Lee, I hope if anybody shoots at you, they're as good a shot as you are. Meaning, of course, it hit him and not me. He kind of laughed, and that was the, uh, the only time I saw him smile or laugh while he's in custody. And I realized later that I was paying him a compliment about his shooting, is what caused him to laugh about it. So uh, he said, Well, uh, the captain told me to follow you. I'll do what you do. And I said, Well, in that case, you'll be on the ground in a hurry. <clears throat> not realizing how quickly that might happen. I saw Jack Ruby standing in the driveway. It seemed to me like he's about middle of the driveway. And I saw the pistol in his hand as he held it by his side. He had it pressed against his side. Of course, no, none of the reporters were looking down. They were all looking up at the face and the heads, and they wasn't looking down and noticed it. But me having to look under those lights, I saw, I spotted a pistol in his hand. Well, I knew exactly what was what was coming. There is, the yeah, there is Lee Oswald. He's been shot. 
He's been shot. Lee Oswald has been shot. There's a man with a gun. It's absolute panic. Absolute panic here in the basement of Dallas Police Headquarters. Detectives have their guns drawn. I saw this blur out of my periphery vision, and then bam. All I really uh, said at first was Oswald has been shot, and I said it twice. Two amazing photographs are taken that day, one by Jack Beers of the Dallas Morning News, and one by Bob Jackson of the Dallas Times Herald. Jack, being up high and being a little to the right, saw it happening and probably reacted and shot his picture six tenths of a second ahead of mine, something like that. And then we were getting the report that we got a hell of a photograph that, that uh, Jack Beers yeah. had got the world-breaking yeah. photograph of Ruby shooting Oswald. Jackson really isn't sure what he has on film until he gets back to the Times-Herald newsroom. Jack Beers' picture was already on the wire, and there was a little group of people out at the wire machine looking at it, and they called me over and they said, do you have anything as good as this? And I said, I'll let you know after I run my film. Uh, so that was a pretty tense moment, you know. So I went in, ran my film. Maziota was standing right outside the door. And I remember holding up the wet negative, you know, and looking at it. And it looked sharp. And that was the first thing, you know, it looked sharp. There it was in the water, I guess that's what, cleaning off some of the chemicals. And I said, I was, I said, there's the Pulitzer Prize winner. All of Dallas could have heard the screaming from that room when he developed yeah. that picture and the image came out of what he had. And I remember letting out a yell of some kind and so we made a wet print, the two of us, uh, made a wet print and carried it out to the newsroom and then we realized we'd beat the Dallas News. Six tenths of a second does become the difference between a great photo and a Pulitzer Prize photo. But Jack Veer's photograph of the Dallas Morning News quickly makes the Associated Press national wire. The Fort Worth Star-Telegram sees it and prints an extra edition of the paper on Sunday night. I got a bundle of those papers myself and took it down to Dealey Plaza and, and sold them. Started selling them like, like a paper boy down there because this was such a huge scoop. And, and, and what made it such a sweet scoop, and there was such competition between the Dallas News and the Star-Telegram in those days, was we were on the streets of Dallas with the Dallas News picture on our front page uh, oh, yeah. on the streets of Dallas before the Dallas News got their and first the edition out. Get... Oswald, meanwhile, has rushed to Parkland Hospital. On the way out to Parkland, the Oswald, moved. I, I was sitting in the back with him holding his right hand pulse, trying to find a pulse, but I never could actually feel a pulse on him. But on the way, about halfway out there, he moved and groaned a little bit and then just went completely limp. And in my mind, I always thought that's probably when he expired, but uh, they didn't pronounce him dead for, for over an hour later. Oswald died at 107, our time, in the operating room of the gunshot wound, which he had Received. When we got him, unloaded him at Parkland and pulled him, put him into the, put him on the stretcher and run him into the operating room. I told the doctors, I said, before you do anything else, I want that bullet out of him. So they just moved, rolled him a little bit, and the doctor pinched it up and hit it with a scalpel, and the bullet uh, dropped out in a plate that a nurse was holding. So I immediately took my trusty pocket knife out, which I always carry, and I had a sharp point on one blade, and I asked her to put her initial on the butt end of that bullet. So I said, you and I will be testifying that this is a bullet that came out of him. And so that's what we, what we did. Oswald is buried at Rose Hill Cemetery in Fort Worth. The only people who show up are a few family members and a horde of reporters and photographers. Six reporters, including Mike Cochran of the Associated Press, serve as pallbearers. Preston McGraw with UPI, who was considerably more experienced, and he was really my only opposition in the other news service. And uh, I had said, I'm not, much I told, I'm not much interested in carrying that casket. And uh, <sighs> Preston says, I'll carry that casket. And it took me about a half second to realize, now here's a guy with experience that knows what he's doing. 
So I said, you know, I've rethought it. I, I also will be a pallbearer. So that's how I became a pallbearer now. But who fired the bullet that killed Oswald? I, I said, who is it? Who is it? He said, Jack Leon Rubenstein. I said, what? He said, Jack Ruby. Jack Ruby, owner of the Carousel Club, a walk-up strip joint on Commerce Street downtown. He's well known in Dallas media circles, always pushing to get some publicity for his club and his dancers. He and a DJ at KLIF Radio are even bowling buddies. He was a groupie. Yeah. And he loved Russ Knight. Russ Knight would bowl with Jack Ruby at the Cotton Bowling Palace. Ruby's a gadfly, always showing up at fires and other major news events. But some in the Dallas Police Department call him a public nuisance. Police saw Ruby coming, they ran the other way. He was persona non grata. We worked to avoid him. He was not our friend. He was not a favorite person. He was a user and a name dropper, and we couldn't tolerate him. Ruby also has a penchant for violence. Janet Conforto, who dances for Ruby under the stage name of Jada, says Ruby is totally capable of shooting Oswald. Would you say he had a, a violent streak in him? Oh, yeah, very much so. Yes, he would get carried away by something and lose all uh, rational thinking. He would just go off, zoom, and just... Uh, he had to uh, prove something... He had to be somebody. But how did Ruby get into the basement in the first place? Paul McCarran was head of police intelligence at the time. He says when a squad car came out of the basement, Ruby slipped in. He did go down the ramp. Hell, he, he knew real Sam Pierce, a lieutenant. Ruby did, and he related to the officers later on. He said, well, I walked up there, boys, and I saw a real Sam Pierce drive out, and I I turned and walked by. It was a spur-of-the-moment thing for Ruby. Just five minutes before he shoots Oswald, he's down the street at the Western Union office wiring $25 to Little Lynn in Fort Worth, one of his strippers seen here on the right. He thought he could be a hero by killing the guy that killed JFK. Just like Oswald, my theory on Jack was that he uh, wanted to have his 15 minutes of glory. He didn't care whether Jackie came back for trial or not. He thought that uh, public sentiment would get him off and that he would make a million dollars because everybody had come to see the man that killed the man that killed the president. The day after Oswald dies, the nation buries a president in Washington. Thousands line up to see the Kennedy casket on display in the Capitol Rotunda. They find it hard to comprehend the tragic loss of the nation's youngest president leaving behind a grieving young widow with two small children. And now there's a new president, tasked with the responsibility of pulling a grieving nation back together. All I have, I would have given gladly not to be standing here today. Back in Dallas, Jack Ruby is charged with murder and stands trial just four months later. His defense attorneys are Joe Tonahill and the flashy California personal injury lawyer Melvin Belli, who has never tried a murder case before. They come up with a unique defense claiming Ruby suffers from psychomotor epilepsy, complex partial brain seizures that sometimes produce automatic violent reactions. But the court-appointed psychiatrist who examined Ruby sees it differently. He was. He was insane. Dr. Robert Beaver says Ruby is paranoid. Ruby sees himself as a victim of a program to wipe out Jews, and it's his fault. Some hotshot uh, had called him a schizophrenic. He wasn't. He was not that. I mean, there was too much juice in him. I mean, if anything, he would have been uh, bipolar, but he wasn't bipolar exactly. He really, and that's why I called him a paranoid, psychotic, depressive. Former Dallas mayor and KRLD reporter at the time, Wes Wise, is among those called to testify. He tells about talking with Ruby outside the Texas School Book Depository the day after the assassination. We chatted for about five or ten minutes, and uh, during the course of the conversation, uh, he made the remark, he said, you know, one of the worst things about this uh, would be if Jackie, the first lady, would have to come back to uh, testify in a murder trial and murder trial, then Oswald was, was a suspect. I guess you'd call him a suspect, yeah. a person of interest or whatever they say these days. And uh, 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 I said, uh, Jack, they'll never do that. They'll never make her come back to Dallas for that. And tears came to his eyes. 
And as a result of that, I was a witness in the, in the Ruby trial, both for the prosecution and for the defense. Ruby is convicted. It's later overturned the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. A new trial is ordered, but Ruby dies of cancer before he can be retried. In the wake of those gunshots in Dealey Plaza, many questions still linger. Almost immediately, President Johnson forms an investigating committee headed by Supreme Court Chief Justice Earl Warren. In September, a report is handed the president saying Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone in killing Kennedy. There are 47 different variations of how John F. Kennedy was killed today in various books and articles and newspapers. But there's only uh, one true fact according to the exhaustive investigation made by the FBI, which has, has withstood all types of examination. Uh, but Lee Harvey Oswald and Lee Harvey Oswald alone were the one who killed Kennedy. And our facts prove that. Some, such as Jackie Kennedy, never talk about it. She and I never talk about the assassination at all, ever. Secret Service agent Clint Hill guarded Mrs. Kennedy and the children for a year after the assassination. The subject never came up at her house or his. I never talked about it with my family. My two sons that grew up, they never knew anything about my being here in Dallas or what happened other than what they read in the history books or learned from the history teacher. So uh, we just never discussed it. Robert Oswald and I have become friends over the years. He's a fine man. He was four years older than Lee. And uh, he went through a certain kind of hell, he and his wife. Uh, Veda. They had kids and they didn't get to change their names. You know, Marina and, and remarried and changed the kids' names, and that helped them out in Rockwall. And uh, Robert lived in Wichita Falls, still does, and his kids didn't change their names, and they took a certain amount of harassment for Oswald's name, you know. My like worst that. moments after the assassination really had to do with the discovery and recognition that Lee was the one who had done it. And to feel, and you know, that I was connected, that I knew him. Um, so when I heard from Rena that yes, he did have a gun, that was bad. And then looking in the garage and seeing that the gun was in fact not there, that was a terrible moment. So I recognized, yes, it could have been Lee. It was. Marina Oswald remarried and still lives in the Dallas area, and at times, apparently, still struggles to make sense of it all. And it broke my heart when she said to me, can you explain something to me? Why are people in, con constantly asking me questions? I just <laughs> don't understand it. And I said, well, let me tell you, you were in a key spot at a key time when the nation changed. And I can tell you this, they're going to be asking you questions for the rest of your life. Dallas suffered a public image catastrophe in the wake of the assassination. It was called the town that killed Kennedy and the city of hate. Cars with Texas license plates were targets for vandalism in California, and taxi drivers in New York City kicked Texans out of their cabs. It did hurt Dallas. The reputation just suffered greatly uh, for a long time. And, uh, however, it did not hurt Dallas economically. The year following the assassination, I mean, the picture, we, Dallas uh, did better than it had the previous year. In medicine, you never know it's hopeless. For more than 40 years, Dr. Kenneth Salyer never talked about his handling of the president in Parkland's emergency room. He calls November 22, 1963, one of the worst days of his life but it also influenced a major change in his life. I was motivated by excellence, motivated by a spirit of helping our human kind. And that came from, in, 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 in retrospect, came from the day that I took care of JFK, who was my hero. I was taken by his spirit and charisma and excitement that he was leading the country. And he had many things to do in his thousand days. He, he got a lot done, made a few mistakes, but I was taken with him. And all of a sudden, you know, here he is on our table. And I just sort of dedicated myself as a result of that to, to helping human, human kind. 
Soudier became the first professor of plastic surgery at UT Southwestern Medical School, started the plastic surgery department at Parkland, and is a pioneer in craniofacial surgery. There were other changes as well. Bob Jackson won a Pulitzer Prize. Wes Wise was elected mayor. Bob Huffaker became a teacher. So did Darwin Payne. Pierce Allman says it was the birth of electronic journalism. There were no, not only no digital, the, the transistor radio was brand new, uh, but the cameras were the old wind-up, you know, film cameras, and there were no cell phones. It was, frankly, amazing, the coverage, considering, uh, you know, the equipment that we had. This really was a turning point in American journalism. Up until this point, most people got their news from print media. Uh, print was the dominant medium and had been for a long, long time. But from that weekend forward, most Americans would get their news from television. Relations now between the press and police are more formal and at arm's length. Government statements are now greeted with more skepticism. While Kennedy's many rumored extramarital affairs were never reported, Bill Clinton was hammered in the media for similar offenses and came within 17 votes of being thrown from office. For those who were there in Dealey Plaza 50 years ago and covered the assassination, the clock is ticking. That's one reason Hugh Ainsworth did all the interviews in this program. A couple of years ago, I was thinking that a lot of these people are dying. I mean, it's been almost 50 years now, and uh, we're going to lose some history here. So I, uh, I just started uh, interviewing them as, as I could catch them. Some were a little hard to catch. Two or three have died since I began that, that quest. Eddie Barker is gone, so is Jerry Hill, Dick DeLoach, and Governor John Connolly. He recovered from his wounds, thanked the Parkland Hospital staff for saving his life, later became Treasury Secretary, and even ran for president himself. The people couldn't have been friendlier, the crowds couldn't have been more wonderful, more generous in their reaction to the president, and. I just had such a good feeling about the, the way they had received him in this city. I had just turned around and said to him, you can't say Dallas doesn't love you, Mr. President. And that was it. Well, a lot of people say this was the awakening of America. It's when we came to face certain facts. You know, we, we all thought that Things like this couldn't happen in America in the last last half century, but we find out since that anything and everything can and often does happen. What happened here in Dealey Plaza 50 years ago will always be the stuff of speculation and remembrance. Despite the historical scar the assassination inflicted on the city, Dallas continued to flourish. The skyline changed, as did stories about what happened here and who was responsible. Was Kennedy killed by a conspiracy or was he, as the Warren Commission found, the victim of a confused and conflicted young man who never quite achieved his goal of being somebody? It's a controversy that may never be settled. To many, John Fitzgerald Kennedy embodied the essence of style and grace in a president. To others, he was a philandering politician, merely seeking re-election in a tough state others told him to avoid. Too dangerous, too risky, they said. But he came here anyway. Another president, also affected by assassination, would have liked that kind of courage. Teddy Roosevelt came to office upon the assassination of William McKinley. Each man has got to carry out his own principles in his own way, he said. My own view has been that if I must choose between taking risks by not doing a thing or by doing it, I will take the risks of doing it. He made those comments at a banquet in 1905 in Dallas. I'm Doug Fox.